Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Light Reading Radio Show sponsored by Sienna. 5G is more than just faster 4G. This is the second radio show for the Sienna Adaptive IP series. My name is Sterling Perrin. I'm a senior principal analyst here with Heavy Reading, and I'm joined today by Raphael Francis. He is a senior director of solution architecture at Sienna, and he has over 20 years' experience in networking and telecom, uh, and I think I've known him for the majority of that time. So uh, very happy to be joined today by Raphael Francis. Hi, Raph, and uh, welcome. Hi, Sterling. Thanks. It's great to be a part of this 5G talk. We have a great topic. Uh, as you know, we have a lot to cover. So um, with that, let's uh, let's just jump right into it. Um, and so, you know, structurally, what uh, I think the way we'll flow this is is starting out at kind of a high level 5G, what's happening um, holistically, and then dig into some of the transport topics. Um, and so with that, you know, as, as we look at the state of 5G, um, commercial adoption, 5G is in motion. We have, uh, I did some checking, the GSA counted as of the end of May, 81 operators on 42 countries, commercial deployments of some form of 5G. It's moved since then. Uh, Omdia forecasts about 230 million 5G subscribers by the end of 2020. So we can say 5G is here. Um, but as you know, uh, Raf, the early push is very much around speed, uh, faster speeds, very much consumer driven. Um, and so I guess just, you know, I want to get your thoughts on on uh, where we are today and, and where do you think we go from, from there? Is it really a, you know, primarily a bandwidth story? Yeah, I agree. It's, you know, the initial use cases, at least, Sterling, we are seeing are primarily about speed. And, and that's the use case that um, 3GPP talks about of, uh, uh, of enhanced mobile broadband or EMBB. Even the commercials we're seeing, you know, on on uh, television are really about that speed. It's really two things: speed and coverage, right? Making sure that there's nationwide coverage, but also talking about those download speeds. And really, for the average consumer, that's that's what's important to us. But the challenge is for these operators that the the average consumer is also not necessarily willing to pay more for that speed. And so. Um, you know, we, we expect better performance, but for about the same price, you know, on a monthly basis for our mobile broadband. So the initial challenge for operators is how will they monetize that? And that's where I think some additional use cases will come into play. While that may not be the initial focus of the 5G rollouts um, that were predominantly based on the 3GPP release 15, for example, you see in the later releases of the of the 5G standards, more emphasis on additional use cases, things like Ultra reliable low latency communication, uh, communications, massive machine type communications, or massive IoT. And what we'll see is that some of those other use cases are, you know, for example, targeted at other verticals. It could be enterprise, it could be, you know, manufacturing, it could be um, uh, government, logistics, entertainment. And those are industries where I think operators hope to monetize more of that investment in 5G and spectrum with some of these more premium uh, services and use cases. So that's something that'll take a little more time, but uh, we see that as being critical to 5G success eventually. Right, so you know, you look at, um, so those are the services, of course there's an architecture and a network that needs to support the service. Um, as as I said up front, and as, as you've pointed out, there are a lot of rollouts today. It's my, very much around the, the bro enhanced broadband application. You know, as you look at the, the 5G architectures, um, what what are the major architectural changes you, to move from that? I think what's commonly called phase one services to phase two, which is kind of what you were alluding to. What uh, you know, at a very high level, uh, what what are the major architectural changes that you see operators need to do to to you know make that move from one phase to the next? You know, one of the key things is, is that 5G is really envisioned as um, being cloud native from day one. And what I mean by that is we're we're in a time when technologies such as SDN and NFE are now mature, right? That wasn't the case whenever LTE was standardized. And so I, I think those that wrote the standards around 5G envisioned that we would we would leverage cloud native or virtualization from day one. So in fact, that's what's happening. We're seeing, that um, you know, it started with 4G cores, but now with 5G cores that are going to be deployed, they're going to be virtualized day one. Day one, and even the RAN elements will be virtualized, and that's what's referred to as as cloud RAN. Uh, 
where, you know, before all the intelligence in the radio access network was distributed out at the radio sites and built into proprietary hardware, now that's becoming more centralized and virtualized on, on compute platforms. And what that results in, that centralization results in different portions of the transport network. Now, it isn't just about backhaul from the radio site, it's about uh, you know front haul and mid haul and back haul. And so we'll, di we'll see different segments of the transport network with this adoption of Cloud RAN. So Cloud RAN and mobile Cloud Core will allow for a lot more elasticity um, and the same ex expectations will be true of the network for it to be adaptive and to be able to adjust to varying demands. Right. So as as we and this kind of gets us into the transport topic, which is the the bulk of, of course, where Sienna plays and the topic for today. Um, so yeah, we we've certainly seen this as you get into five G transport. Um, you know, not exclusively, but for the most part, these are kind of the five G segments of transport: the front hall, which you've mentioned, the mid hall, and then back hall, which existed in four G but continues to um, to exist. Uh, maybe spend a little bit of time on that. Can you kind of talk us through front hall, mid hall, back hall, um, and in terms of the requirements and the um, and the the technologies that that would support them, and kind of how you know how they're different? Sure. Yeah. So with 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 back hall, you know, for example, in an LTE use case, um, the the RAN and all the intelligence, as I'd mentioned, was in the radio site in what was called an E node B. But the E-Node-B was really a combination of the radio head and, and the baseband unit. With 5G, um, not only does that baseband get centralized, but it also gets split into two, into what's called the distributed unit and the centralized unit. And those segments of the network are, are what become front hall, mid hall, back hall, where between the radio and the DU is the front hall, between the DU and the, and the CU is the mid hall, and then from the CU back to the mobile core. And each of those segments of the network has different requirements and expectations, such as latencies. For example, the front hall, we're talking about low hundreds of microseconds of, of latency budget. In the mid hall, it's you know maybe low uh, single digit milliseconds, where in the back hall, you might be talking about 10 milliseconds or more. So there's also some different protocols and interfaces in each of these different segments where front hall has things like CIPRI and eCIPRI, and then the newer standard for front hall, which is ORAN, defined by the, the Open RAN Alliance. And that's really meant for the evolution of mobile infrastructure to be more, more open and, um, and vendor neutral. So certainly not just about backhaul as we move to, to 5G. Uh, what, I guess what, what would you say in terms of the requirements, what are you seeing as the, as the hardest? What's the hardest nut to crack among those? <laughs> Well, between those, I would say front hall has um, some of the most stringent requirements because of the latencies mentioned, uh, jitter requirements. Um, the, the, there are some different interfaces and protocols, as I mentioned. And depending on how you're handling front hall, you could do it in such a way that's you know, completely transparent and uh, independent of what the RAN vendor is. However, there, there are other ways that might that you could implement front hall that require collaboration with the RAN vendor. So um, we, we like to use the term X hall because it's really going to be, we're going to see a convergence or a combination of uh, front hall, mid hall and transport or front hall, mid hall and back hall transport segments, pardon me, um, come together, especially when you talk about that cloud RAN hub or C RAN hub where some of the virtualization of the RAN will happen. We'll see a convergence of these different types of transport and we'll see the need for tight timing, synchronization, low latency, layer two, layer three services, and the implementation of things like network slicing. Yep, and so those things would go across all three of those segments? Correct. Generally, with the exception of perhaps network slicing, where some operators and mobile you know, infrastructure vendors think of slicing as really starting after the DU, so in other words, in the mid hall and back hall, there are ways you can carve up resources in the front hall as well, but but generally, yeah, the rest of those things, timing, sync, the fact that you need deterministic low latency transport, layer two, layer three transport and services, that will be really end to end. Yep. And so, you know, so we have the role of IP, um, maybe spend some time on, on uh, IP networks. Uh, of course, we had them in 4G, 
um, where backhaul was the primary, you know, transport segment. That's where where transport uh, resided to these um, uh, to the to the cell sites, um, the macro cells. Um, but how do you see the role of IP changing as we move to to 5G? And I guess you know you you can cut it across th those different segments to to a degree. You know, right. backhaul does it, you know how does backhaul change? Um, sure. And then, of course, as I sort of uh, just uh, asked a little bit about before, you know, how it infiltrates into the um, mid hall and, and front hall. But maybe start with the back hall and then see, um, you know, kind of flesh out some of the other segments. Yeah, and the back hall, I, mean, I think, um, in general, what we'll see is that, um, and th this impacts the back hall as well, because, uh, you know, when I mentioned front hall, mid hall, back hall, you know, operators are going to deploy different um, architectural approaches, even in even in their same network um, across a nationwide scale, where there might be some regions or could be urban environments versus rural environments, where they might choose more of a front hall architecture in urban um, in order to take advantage of of, of you know the the population density there, whereas in rural it could be more backhaul. So, but in general, what what you'll have in 5G is densification of a lot more radio sites, right, in order to get the bandwidth and, and in order to get the coverage. So even some of those radio sites that will be backhauled or mid-hauled, um, there's going to be more of them. And so with more radio sites, you'll have more network elements that support IP, more IP-enabled endpoints. And therefore, it would be challenging to, mat to, to manage an IP network at such scale if you were using you know, just traditional legacy protocols. And so I think what a lot of operators are looking for is a way to simplify the network from an IP perspective, um, use more automation, use more centralized intelligence. Um, and so that's why you're seeing a lot of interest in, in protocols like segment routing, both SRMPLS and SRV6, and, and that being talked about in a 5G context because of the need for simplification, the need for automation. Right. So, so when when you and with Sienna has conversations with operators around, uh, the, you know, the future IP transport networks, um, you know, there's capacity, there's cost. Would you say, you know, these other requirements that are coming in are equally important, or even to a degree more important, or does it still primarily, what's the capacity, what's the cost, and then let's talk about some other stuff. Yeah, I think capacity and cost are definitely. Key obviously for, from a backhaul perspective, as as you'd mentioned, capacity continue to to increase um, naturally, and and what that means is, you know, even in a backhaul context, if there's a backhaul radio site, you're going to have more capacity out of that radio site. We've seen those radio sites grow from one gig to ten gig backhaul connections, and now the need for more 25 gig. Um, in fact, radios, 5G radios themselves, have a lot of 25 gig density, um, and so. For example, the traditional cell site routers, let's say in a backhaul context, um, don't even have really the density of 25 gig interfaces. It's a relatively newer Ethernet standard. And so you need not just 25 gig E, but we're seeing, um, you know, in some cases, uh, macros where you want to, might want to have 100 gig out of there. Uh, and, then, and then we're seeing, um, for example, 200 gig E and even 400 gig E interest maybe not so much out of a given macro site, but once you aggregate multiple sites, let's say in a CRAN hub, and you have that convergence of front hall, mid hall, back hall, we're going to see the, the, the need for 200 gigi and 400 gigi out of those sites. So for sure, um, capacity is a, is a factor. And then within the other thing I, you know, in terms of architectures, within these cloud RAN hubs, the other thing to mention is that, you know, these are in fairly close proximity to the radio sites because of the latencies involved for front hall, let's say 10 kilometers, maybe 10 to 15 kilometers. And that's where these virtualized RAN elements are sitting. Because all that is virtualized and there's compute there, you now have more of a leaf spine architecture to interconnect um, via any to any those, those virtualized RAN elements. And uh, a lot of those interfaces from, from the leaf switches down to the servers also need a lot of 25 gig density. So that too results in you know, helping the operators reduce their costs through virtualization, through these um, you know, data center fabric style architectures. Mm -hmm. So yeah, w one of the things you know, beyond capacity and cost that always comes up, and we've alluded to it a little bit even through this discussion, but you know, network slicing, um, it affects the entire um, 
the 5G architecture, but of course the transport's a piece to that. I'm wondering if you could just spend a, a couple minutes um, d defining segment, uh, defining slicing um, uh, in the context of transport and the different use cases and just kind of how Siena sees, sees slicing unfolding for transport. Yeah, I agree. So for sure, network slice slicing is going to be critical to help monetize 5G, as I as I um, you know talked about with other verticals. So for example, um, enterprises, uh, and there's a lot of different use cases being talked about for for network slicing, and it's still something that's that's materializing out there in mobile operators' networks. You know, the first step is they have to deploy 5G cores, and then they have to take advantage of the fact that these 5G cores have this slicing capability. So there'll be use cases such as emergency services, manufacturing, you know, automotive, uh, entertainment, um, you know, logistics, transportation, et cetera, where operators can position 5G into these different market segments and, and monetize above and beyond the typical uh, consumer market segment. So that's gonna be, that's gonna be critical for them. Yeah, that's a good point. So, you know, we haven't seen much slicing done today in the network, as we've talked about in the past. Um, but slicing and, and phase two services and, and, and the move to the enterprise are going to be very, very interlinked, it sounds like. Uh, that's right. And and really, it'll be something that, from our perspective, slicing has to really happen end to end. Mm -hmm. It has to happen across the, the RAN, the transport, and the core. And it's the coordination of these different portions of the network that'll be important uh, to make network slicing successful. And we see both a couple different flavors of, hop, of of slicing. We talk about soft slicing, hard slicing, and we think both of those over time will be important for operators to consider. Yep, absolutely. Um, I, I knew this would go quickly. We, we are running short on time, so I did want to get into uh, to close out the uh, kind of a, a vendor specific topic, which is the you know the the position of of Sienna within this market. Um, and it can kind of go both ways, your position. Um, but you know, Sienna is not an incumbent RAN vendor, uh, so you are, you, well, you're not a new kid on the block, but you're you're not a radio supplier into into 5G. Um, right. So you know, given that, what what do you see as Sienna's unique role uh, and the contributions that you make to 5G, uh, given your history and just the position in uh, as, as not a radio supplier? Sure. So, as we've discussed, you know, throughout our conversation, Sterling, I think the the for five G to be successful, it's really going to require, you know, an end to end solution. And so, while most think about five G as being really about the radios, about the spectrum, about the mobile core, the transport that interconnects all those things, especially in these new architectures like cloud ran architectures um, that have these different transport segments, those things have, all have to work. Uh, with a high level of, of deterministic performance guarantees, support all the layer two, layer three services, you know, for the overall end user experience to be to be successful. So, you know, in the ecosystem, we still see a lot of mobile operators making decisions about, um, you know, RAN and, and mobile core vendors, independent of transport vendors. But at the same time, we also work closely with uh, certain RAN vendors on joint end-to-end -end solutions. Um, you know, although since our products are open and programmable, you know, frankly, we can we can interoperate with any of these RAM vendors. Right. Uh, good points. Uh, and I, I will just make uh, one note because, you know, as Sienna, you would, of course, make this argument, um, you know, for uh, you don't need to be an incumbent radio vendor. But our, our survey data does support that as well when we've asked in these questions. Uh, they really are going for best of breed and, you know, for the reasons you've stated. Um, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. Uh, but, uh, Raf, it's been great catching up with you. Uh, really appreciate your insights today. And, and thanks for joining us. Great. Yeah, thanks. It was a really good discussion. I appreciate it, Sterling. All right. We'll have to do this again sometime. Uh, and for the audience, um, thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in. And join us for Sienna's third adaptive IP session, which is going to be Let's Talk About Segment Routing. So actually a bit of a deep dive on some of uh, what what uh, Raf brought up today. Uh, but that third session will be with James Glover with Sienna. He's Director of Product Line Management, and he'll be joined by uh, my colleague, Don Fry, who's a Principal Analyst at Omdia. So thank you, everybody.